This special lecture is a follow-up to finish off the discussion on linear solvers, and I wanted to show you how we solve the heat transfer problem using the Tomas algorithm. So I'm starting off with the notebook that we used to solve the heat transfer problem. If you remember, this is what where we had landed last time. Uh, we had a few uh, things we were trying out. Um, and let's get back to some of the settings we had. We had the source term, and then we solved the we solved for the temperature, uh, and then we plotted it, and then I showed you how to do the color bar. It's kind of where we left off. Today, I want to continue building on this by adding timings to, uh, to this problem and solving it with the Tomas algorithm. So first, I want to bring in the Tomas algorithm over here, and I already copied it. Uh, it is supposed to be in your canvas folder, uh, the entire Tomas algorithm. So you can go ahead and copy, copy it and paste it, or just copy it from the PDF of the slides. Uh, so you can bring it perhaps and put it at the at the top if you want. So let's just bring it in, put it in here. And like I said, the Tomas algorithm takes lower diagonal, main diagonal, upper diagonal, and the right hand side, and it returns the solution. So what we're going to do next is solve the same heat transfer problem, but using the Tomas algorithm. So we're going to do um, result Tomas is equal simply called the Tomas algorithm. And if you forgot the function signature, shift tab gives you the function signature. We're going to go L, D, U, and B. We already have all of those ingredients here. We have the main diagonal, we have the upper diagonal, we have the lower diagonal, and the right-hand side. And if you run it, it just returns the temperature you, you, you solved using the Tomas algorithm and puts it in result Tomas. Now, the first way to check this is to plot the result from the Tomas algorithm. So we're going to do plt.plot, again, uh, plotting the result from Tomas versus x. So we already have x set up, and we're going to do result Tomas and result Tomas. And I'm going to give it a symbol, um, say O, a circle. Now, when you plot that, well, really, you can't see a thing because the there's so many points. There's 200 points covers the whole thing. So there's a little trick with uh, Matplotlib where you can skip uh, symbols, skip markers, and it's it's called just simply an option as mark every. So mark every 10 points instead of every point, and then you see now the distribution of the Tomas um, solution. It clearly is on top of it visually, but we're going to need to have to verify that um, more uh, more quantitatively. Okay. Now, the reason why we went after the Tomas algorithm is to show you that there are other solvers in the world that are more efficient and more specific for uh, for certain problems. Yes, we have the NumPy Lin algebra solve, but that's the most inefficient kind of solver. It is quite general and robust. However, it is inefficient for many, many, many problems that are practical. And what I want to try to show you next is how expensive the standard solver methodology is, which is based on Gaussian elimination compared to the Tomas algorithm for this particular problem. So we're going to bring in some timings. And for that, uh, I want you to go ahead and import time. So simply import time and run this again. And from the time uh, from the time library, I'm going to bring in some timers. So there are several components here that uh, we need to time. First, I need to time the building of those arrays. So I'm going to do uh, of those main diagonals. Sorry, um, tick time dot time. You simply record the time as a tick. And then at the end here, I want to do a talk. And then let's call this cost um, diagonals. This is the cost of assembling the diagonals. And do talk minus tick. OK, and let's print this out. Um, diagonals, cost of diagonals is um, cost diagonals. And that's going to be in seconds. Okay. 
Now you can format this a little bit. Um, we can discuss this later. Let's just now continue doing the timings. Uh, I want to include actually the right hand side assembly in this. Okay, hold the right hand side. Those are the standard matrices. Now there's also a cost associated with this matrix because like I said, this is a dense matrix like we said last time. Uh, so it is going to cost time and memory to assemble it. We'll measure memory a little later. But for now, um, let's measure the time cost to assemble the matrix. And cost dense matrix is going to be uh, talk minus tick also in seconds. And then I'm going to copy this guy over here, put it here. Matrix, dense matrix cost dense matrix okay now for the other two pieces we have to time the result from the standard solver and i'm also going to do tick time dot time and talk equal time dot time and then cost uh, solver is equal talk minus tick and then we're also going to print cost solver which is the built-in solver Call it cost solver, and we're gonna time the Tomas algorithm. Talk equal time dot time, and also we're gonna build cost for the Tomas algorithm, also in seconds. And we're gonna call this cost Tomas and cost Tomas. Let's see if we run this, um, we get an error. And yeah, this is the error here. Okay, so now you can see um, these numbers. Let's format them a little bit. There's a little formatting function um, where you specify how many decimal points you need here. Um, so we can type in as follows. You can just follow this uh, uh, this format and use it however you like. And just. It's called the formatting function in Python. It's kind of beyond what I really want to discuss, but this is this is saying this is a um, a floating point with a precision of um, just six significant figures, and you give it this format. Okay, so let's just do it on all of those to get slightly more readable. Okay, so now we run it. Okay, we get some uh, reasonable numbers and they're comparable, right? Uh, between the standard solver and the Tomas, uh, the cost of the diagonals, cost of the matrix, not that bad. Okay, so what do we do next? Let's try to measure memory as well, all right? So for to measure memory, uh, there is a little function from the system library and you do this from sys import get size of it roughly gives you the size and bytes of an object okay now I want this size to be readable in megabytes actually so I'm gonna divide by um, uh, so one megabyte has 1024 kilobytes and one kilobyte has 1024 bytes so I'm gonna divide by 1024 squared okay so what I want to do here is um, Diagonals, let's just do memory mem diags is equal get size of L and I want to add the size of uh, U plus the size of D. I'm not going to measure B because it's the same across. Okay, and I'm going to divide those by 1024 squared. Okay. And then print um, diagonals, memory, diagonals, diagonals, okay, mem diags, okay, and that is in megabytes. And that's in megabytes, okay. Now we do the same thing for A, and I'm gonna call it dense memory. Or memory mem dense mem a. Let's just call it mem a. And get size of a. 
over 1024 over 1024 and I also want to print the size memory for a a in megabytes all right let's perhaps put those at the end so that we can separate the cost um, in seconds from the computational cost from the memory cost and notice that the cost for the the total cost of the solver is actually the cost of the solver itself plus the cost of assembling this matrix because the Tomas algorithm doesn't have the cost of assembling the matrix included okay so let's see what happens let's run this again now and we have a decent uh, comparable memory size is not bad let's add the formatting over here so we can we can read this better diagonals and then a okay so 0 0.3 megabytes for memory for a and about two orders of magnitude less for storing the diagonal so you can already see that a is more costly than just storing the diagonals but this is not significant at this size but let's go for bigger um, numbers of equations so let's go ahead and do it with a thousand equations so that's a thousand grid points again run everything Okay, so now you run it and you immediately see that in terms of cost, the solver and the Tomas are still about on par. Um, and I would say they're almost equivalent. This shows to be just about four times or five times more than the Tomas um, cost. In terms of memory, though, you could see that the memory size is about um, still two orders of magnitude higher than just storing the diagonals. So 7.6 megabytes just to store um, this matrix A with a thousand points, okay? So let's go ahead and do now 10,000 points and see how that cost is gonna explode. All right, so you can see now the dense matrix assembly 0.8 seconds. The solver cost is about two seconds. The Tomas algorithm cost, it's still uh, around 0 0.01, which is just linear growth. But this one is starting to go in polynomial time. However, look at the matrix, the memory for the matrix, storing that full matrix, 762 megabytes, wherever just storing the diagonal, 0 0.22 megabytes. That's nothing, okay? And this is only for 10,000 equations for 10,000 points. In practice, we have far, far more points. Um, and you can try that for yourself. So you can go perhaps maybe 30,000 uh, grid points before it crashes. Okay. Cost to assemble the diagonals is not much. 0 0.0015 seconds. 0 0.0016 seconds. Dense matrix assembly is 8.6 seconds. Okay. Imagine having to repeat that this calculation hundreds of thousands of times. Um, this becomes immediately unfeasible. Now we're still waiting for the standard solver to solve. All right, so now, now it's now it's done. Um, the solver cost was 46 seconds. The cost for Tomas just barely doubled from the previous case. It's nothing, 0 0.04 seconds. The cost for the memory of A is 6,000, 7,000 megabytes. All right, so that's a lot of memory. That's a lot of memory. And in fact, it's uh, probably starting to um, uh, slow down my computer over here. So if you see, um, I can see here that the cost for Python um, is, look at that. This is the cost, the memory cost for Python now is 7.7 um, 7 gigabytes. That's how much, um, that's, the, that's what A is consuming. Okay, um, so this is huge, all right? This is a lot of memory. And I can probably go and restart this to clear the memory. Okay. So it should be restarted now. Okay. Okay, so now that you've seen um, these sorts of costs, I want to switch back 
to the slides a little bit. I'm going to bring in these slides. And um, one of you asked me last time, how do we know that the cost of the Tomas algorithm is cheaper than the cost of the standard solver? Besides just observation, we can actually count the number of operations that take place um, in an algorithm. So the number of multiplications, the number of divisions, additions, etc. And we say that typically the cost of an algorithm scales with the number of operations. Without going into too much detail, this is called algorithm complexity. And it is a measure of how long an algorithm would take to complete given an input of size n. So in this case, our size of interest is the number of equations or the number of points. Now what I'm showing here is the cost or the algorithmic complexity of matrix inverse Gaussian elimination and the Tomas algorithm. And it's expressed as order of something. In other words, it's proportional to, uh, uh, to whatever is inside that order. So for example, matrix inverse says it's order n cubed, which means that the cost of the algorithm scales with n cubed. Okay, So it's not linear, it's quite nonlinear, it's polynomial time. So in other words, the time for solution for the matrix inverse or Gaussian elimination, which is the same, is proportional to n cubed. So if you double the number of equations, the cost is not going to double, okay? It is going to be multiplied by a factor of 8 because it's going to be 2 cubed. However, for the Tomas algorithm, its complexity is order n, which means the solution time is proportional to n and it's linear. If you double the number of equations, the cost is just going to double in time, which is a very desirable feature for an algorithm. All right. So now we did the solution between the Tomas and the NumPy uh, built-in solver. How do we compare the two solutions? Right? We plotted them on top of each other, and that gave us a decent qualitative assessment of that solution. They're on top of each other, but we need a better measure to compare those two um, quantitatively. And if you think about it, the solution for the Tomas algorithm was an array of solutions shown here in tilts, T or temperature, TDMA is T, t tilde 0, T tilde 1, and so on. For NumPy, we're going to designate the solution with bars, T0 bar, T1 bar, etc. Um, and the question is, how could we compare the two solutions? One might say, I want you to take a moment to think about it, but one might say, hey, we take the difference between um, the two arrays, right, individually, point by point. So Let's suppose here these are the numbers for the temperature with TDMA and the numbers with NumPy. You can take the difference element-wise, but that is still an array bet between, uh, of the difference between the two, 0, 0 0.6, 0 0.1, um, these numbers over here, minus 0 0.1, and so on. It's still not a single measure of the error. So we need to summarize that entire uh, array of errors into a single number. And for that, we use vector, what's called vector norms. In other words, we measure the magnitude of the array. An array can be thought of as simply an n-dimensional vector. And you can um, take the norm of that array, uh, treating it as a vector, and to get a, an estimate of what the value of that, what's an, a, a, a representative value of that array is. There are many norms. They're called the L norms. For vectors, the L1 norm simply takes the sum of the entire elements in the array, sum of the absolute values. The L2 norm, which is the Pythagorean norm, which is what you're, um, um, what you're familiar with for Pythag the Pythagorean th theorem, square root of a squared plus b squared, essentially takes the square root of all of the entries in this error, a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared, each entry. Um, and takes the square root, sums them up, and takes the square root. That's the L2 norm. Then there's the L-infinity norm. One could argue, well, I'm going to take the worst error value between the difference and treat that as my representative error. All of those norms are valid norms, and they can be done very quickly in Python using numpy.linalgebra.norm. You give it the first argument, you give it the array, and the second argument, you give it um, the value of uh, which norm you want. L1 norm, L2, or L infinity. I usually use the L2 norm, but it really doesn't matter which one um, you choose. Now, because the error itself is a vector, we can get a sense of its size, like I said, if we compute this norm and get a sense of its magnitude. Okay, so let's try this now in Python. So I'm going to run this again and make sure you do it for 
a hundred equations, so it doesn't take a, a long time. All right, so now we have the result between Tomas and the standard result. So if I take the difference, result Tomas minus result, it's going to be an array with a hundred entries in it, okay? With a hundred entries in it. Now, let's ask the question, what do we expect um, the difference to be? If you take a moment to think about this, because the Tomas algorithm and the built-in solver are both the last solvers, we expect them to get the exact solution. And therefore, we expect the difference to be essentially zero between those two. And indeed, when we take the norm between the two, and let's call this um, adder, okay, and then we do a numpy.linalgebra.norm adder, we take the L2 norm, it's going to give us a single representative number, which is 2.78 times 10 to the minus 12. Um, there is, you could say that there is some error. This is only due to round off, nothing more. These two solvers are exact solvers, and they should get the exact solution correctly. All you're seeing here are simply, um, uh, are simply round off errors. Okay. So let's go back to the slides. All right. The next question is, how can you tell that the solution, your solution of the system of equations is valid? And can you measure the error in that? Now, we, what we did here was we took the difference between two methods to solve the problem. They were consistent, but we didn't check that actually the solution satisfies our original system of equations. So if you think about it, if our system of equations is AX equal B, and our numerical solution shown here is red, in red, call it X tilde, what you could do is take X tilde and put it back in the system of equations and ask yourself, does my x tilt satisfy the system of equations? In other words, does a x tilt actually equal to b? Um, and that immediately allows you to measure the error. In other words, um, um, you can take the difference between b and a x tilt, and that would be an error. Now, the other question is, is this error a single value, a vector, or a matrix? It is a vector, it's an array, right? Because B is an array, A X tilde is an array, or B is a vector, A X tilde is a vector, right? And then the error is actually a vector, just a, a single array. Now for that error, it's still a number of points, as many equations there are, as there are. If you have 50 equations, then E is of size 50. So then, because it's a vector of errors, we can also take the norm of E, Okay, to measure the error in the committed in our numerical solution. And just like we defined absolute and relative errors, we, we can also define absolute and relative errors um, in this case over here. And the absolute error is simply B minus A X tilde. But sometimes you need a relative error because the right-hand side does matter in your solution. So you take B minus A, A X tilde and divide it by the right-hand side. That's a standard way of measuring um, the relative error in linear systems. We treat the right-hand side as um, essentially what we're taking things relative to because the right-hand side in a way is a forcing term that is forcing the solution to reach a certain value, just like the heating we did. It was forcing the temperature to reach a certain value. Now notice you can divide by a matrix, but you can divide, but this division here is done um, element-wise. So you take B minus A, A X tilde and simply divide it divide each entry by each entry of B and then take them all. Okay, so let's try that out um, in Python for our problem. So um, what I'm gonna do um, now, I'm gonna try, um, call it, let's say E1, and I'm gonna take the result, the standard system minus our matrix, okay, A time, sorry, um, B minus result minus A, at result, agreed? So that defines an error, if I print E1. Okay, so that's the error committed um, in our numerical solution because this is the numerical solution, that's our X tilde essentially, that's result. Um, a X tilde, B minus A X tilde gives us an error. Now I can do the norm, I can do um, MP, oops, M MP dot lin algebra dot norm. L2 norm, and that gives us a 10 to the minus 12 norm, which is what we expect. This is an exact solver, 
it should get the exact solution. What we're seeing here are just simply round off errors. This 10 to the minus 12 can be considered um, essentially zero. Okay, we can do the same for um, the Tomas algorithm in algebra.norm. We can do B minus A at result Tomas, and we can do an L2 norm and print E2. Okay, and with this, we um, end the lecture on linear solvers. Um, thank you for your attention. There's plenty of additional material at the end of, um, of these slides that you are welcome to take a look at. And uh, I will see you on Tuesday.